Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DMICE Informatics Conference, and I guess welcome to some number of people who are out there uh, watching by streaming, as I did from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, uh, last, a couple weeks ago. Anyways, um, we have uh, a speaker um, from uh, uh, a visitor today from from Massachusetts, and so uh, we'll um, just that this conference isn't always just uh, us uh, talking to ourselves. In fact, um, we have another uh, visiting speaker tomorrow morning. Uh, I, I, I know it kind of came about with short notice, but um, uh, um, you can find the flyers about it. Uh, around the building. Anyway, so um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jenna Marquard, who um, is currently at the uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. She graduated from the University of Iowa in 2003 with a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and then uh, pursued uh, graduate studies in that field at University of Wisconsin-Madison and uh, worked under the uh, supervision of a very good friend of mine uh, and very good friend of many of yours, uh, Dr. Patty Brennan, and um, uh, conducted research uh, in areas of consumer health informatics, decision making, and health information exchange. And for the last six years, she's been at UMass Amherst, and her current research uses methods from engineering psychology, visualization and computer science fields to understand consumers and providers information search and decision making patterns. She's uh, funded in her research by the National Science Foundation and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which funds a fair amount of work in this department. And um, she's uh, visiting here today and is going to do a sabbatical here um, this fall. Um, and so uh, you'll get a little uh, uh, introduction today, and then if you're interested, um, maybe can uh, uh, spend more time with her in the fall. So I will turn it over to Jenna. Thank you so much for the introduction, Bill. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today uh, for a variety of reasons. Excited to be able to come back this fall, and so um, I'm hoping that this talk spurs some discussions in terms of fun things that we might be able to work on and um, also spurs discussions with um, folks in terms of having uh, meetings while I'm here. But again, really interested in talking to you about three things. The first thing is I want to give you some background about uh, who I am and where I'm coming from. I'm an engineer and so I have a slightly different background than quite a few of you and so I want to give you a high level overview of the types of work that my group does and why I think industrial engineering is an important part of the types of things that we're all interested in. And then want to talk specifically kind of at a high level about a few different projects that we're working on to give you some sense for how this vision that we have is played out in, in terms of the actual work that we do. So when my group thinks about what our vision is, we're really thinking about improving health, right, like all of us are, by improving decision making and the decision making of consumers, providers, whether that be physicians or nurses. Um, and when we think about health, we think about that happening on a continuum. And so that could be health related activities that happen in a person's home or outside of um, traditional care settings as they're self-managing diseases or recovering from acute episodes of care. We also think about that happening in routine office visits um, in primary care settings and we think about that uh, in inpatient settings and acute um, treating acute conditions or um, incidents that come up. So as, I, as we think about health and improving decision making, we're really thinking about that in a variety of contexts. In terms of our approach, we're really thinking about to improve decision making, how we can provide the right information at the right time and in the right format. And oftentimes, but not always, that's involving some type of health information technology or informatics intervention, but not always. So we're thinking about um, decision making when it does and when it doesn't involve those types of technologies. From an industrial engineering perspective and a cognitive science perspective, we know that there's this tension when we think about decision making that individuals, 
are capable of making really complicated decisions. We can see patterns in information a lot of times. Um, we can make inferences about things in a really um, complicated, in complicated ways. But on the other side of that spectrum, we also have really limited information processing capabilities in some ways. And so there's this tension between, well, we're really good at making decisions in some ways, and we're really limited in some of the things that we can do. So health information technology or informatics interventions might be able to help people uh, overcome some of these limitations. So that's the, the framework that we're coming, coming from when we think about our projects. So something that a lot of you are very familiar with is Charles Friedman proposed not too long ago. Um, his fundamental theorem of informatics, right? So the thinking that when we're talking to this community, we're not thinking that computers or informatics interventions are replacing people. We're thinking about the idea that a person plus this intervention or tool um, can do something more than that person could do alone. And as I talk through our projects today, I'm going to reference back to the general structure of what this looks like uh, as a context or framework. What I want to point out or bring to, bring to mind is that industrial engineers and human factors experts in particular have known this for a really long time and it's actually a guiding premise of a lot of the things that they do. And not only do, does that community know this, um, but they have methods and approaches to help address this or make it a reality. Um, but this talk is about interdisciplinary research. And so we think about as industrial engineers, one of our big challenges is that we don't work in isolation. Um, and so we need teams of people that can come together to determine what are clinically relevant problems, if, that's, if we're in the healthcare domain, um, to take full advantage of potential evaluation strategies. So human factors approaches are part of that, but there's other strategies from disciplines uh, that can be helpful. And then to more easily disseminate the results of our work. So we think about identifying relevant problems, putting together a whole slew of tools that we could use to address those problems, and then disseminating them back to the, to the right communities. So again, we think about this as a spectrum. And really, to do this, uh, interdisciplinary teams can add quite a bit. I've put up here, and this isn't an ex exhaustive list, but the folks that I've had the um, honor or opportunity to work with while I've been at the University of Massachusetts. And I primary, primarily work with people from four other domains than mine. Um, work with great physician colleagues, nursing colleagues, uh, folks from computer science in a lot of our work, and then uh, physicians whose uh, core responsibilities are now in informatics. So again, this is not the um, whole group of people I've had the opportunity to work with, but just to, just to give some overview of the types of folks that I've been able to work with. And as I talk through these projects, I'll, I'll point back to uh, which of these folks has been involved in each of the projects. So I want to return to this idea of um, a year in the life of, of someone and how decisions unfold as we think about that as, the, as a context. The first thing that I want to think about are um, folks that are self-managing, say, chronic diseases or conditions outside of the formal care environment. So if we look back or think back about uh, this fundamental theorem of informatics, this could take a variety of forms. So it might be a single individual using some type of technology or intervention being able to do something um, that they couldn't before. So do something, take actions, change behaviors, or make decisions uh, in, an, in a better way than they could have without that. It also might look like a team of people. So it could be an individual and their informal caregivers, so family or friends, uh, different folks that are helping them uh, manage health in some way using an informatics intervention. Uh, or it could be an individual and their care team trying to accomplish, accomplish some task or make some decision um, using an informatics intervention or health IT tool in a way, in a better way than they might have without that. My life in 2012 actually looked a lot like this. So the first, the first two examples I'll give are um, simple things from my life that played out and aligned with these concepts really well. So I've owned for several years uh, the Withings scale. And 
the basic concept of this is it's hooked up to your home wireless network. And every time you step on it, it sends that data to um, so your smartphone, your app, or your um, tablets, your uh, computers. So it's, it's sending it wherever you need it and aggregating it. Could be good, it could be scary, uh, whatever, your, whatever your thoughts are. So this was basically 2012 for me. Any, any guesses on what happened right there? I was pregnant, yeah. So um, what was interesting about this is that I would go into um, see a midwife or a nurse every month, and they appeared to be very concerned about my weight. In terms of they would take care to measure it, they would enter it in places. It seemed like this was an important thing to them. And yet, I'm showing up at different times of year, different times of day, wearing different clothes, and so I'm not convinced it's good data. And yet, they're, they're providing me this sense that this is really important. So I've been doing this for a long time, and I kept um, monitoring this during the time that I was pregnant. And basically what this, what this gave me was some sense that things were OK, right? I had shortened a feedback loop and basically gotten information more frequently than I was before um, and was feeling like it was much more reliable data. So in this case, this was really simple. I had one type of data that, for me, was serving as a proxy, that things were going, that things were going OK. So it wasn't even necessarily this data. It was the meaning behind this data. So that I was eating OK, that the baby was doing good, those kinds of things. So again, this is me acting alone. I wasn't sharing this data with anyone. It was just me looking at it um, and getting some, some sense that things were OK. Then Edison comes along. So, Dressed him in a in a shirt that is that is Portland relevant. <laughs> relevant. Um, so he comes along in November of 2012, and any new parent will realize that things feel a little bit out of control. And so had found this application that allowed you on your smartphone or tablet. Again, it was synced from whatever devices that you um, wanted to, and it would allow you to really easily log when you were um, feeding him, uh, when you were changing his diapers, when, you were, um, when he was sleeping, all different kinds of, of data you could log really easily. Um, and what this helped us do in, in a variety of different contexts, and again, this was, we would, we would go in to see a provider, and they would make it seem like there were certain things that were really important. And so they would ask us questions about how often you know, he was eating and how often we were changing his diaper and these kinds of things. And we didn't have data, right, except for this. So this made that conversation a whole lot easier. And then we would be traveling, and we could really easily maintain awareness of when things were happening. So it was helping us um, get some sense for, for how things were going. The other thing it did was help with mental health. And so things change slowly, and it doesn't feel like much is changing. Um, but wanted to show those early morning hours, and this is a difference of about a month and a half, and how different our life became over the course of that month and a half. So we could actually really look back and see how much things had changed, um, and that provided a, a lot of relief. Again, very simple set of data, but this is that second example where it's myself as a care provider, an informal care provider, for Edison, my son. And together, we're using this intervention. And it's helping um, in a way that just, just I, couldn't, I couldn't do myself. The third example of an individual interacting with their care team uh, is a research project I'm going to describe. So this is, we're shifting away from, from my life to one of our research projects. Again, but still looking at. Um, self-managing outside the home. This is a project with um, a few different organizations. So Barry Saver uh, at the top is a primary care physician who works at UMass Medical School. Um, Peggy Prusi is a nurse who works at a group called Reliant Medical Group, a practice of about uh, 20 clinics and about 200 physicians in central Massachusetts. And then Mike Kelleher and Larry Garber uh, are also physicians at that practice. Um, Larry is the, is the practicing, uh, the lead of their informatics group. 
there. So this is our this is our team that's looking at this project. It's a HRQ uh, funded project, controlling diabetes using inexpensive health IT, really in the context of um, diabetes hypertension in diabetics. So again, slightly we're measuring hypertension in diabetics. This is an area of significant interest to the primary care physician um, that I interact with. So the goal of this was to do a randomized control trial of an intervention. Um, that would do a few things. One would support patient provider management of hypertension and diabetics. So again, we're going back to this idea of an individual plus their care team, but still self-management at home outside of formal care settings. Uh, from a human factor standpoint, we want this to require minimal workload on the behalf of the patient and provider. We know that's a big deal. Um, it was of significant interest to me to try to use off-the-shelf technology mainly because then it could be more inexpensively implemented, perhaps, in other settings, and regardless of what platforms they had in place, whether it was you know, Epic or Cerner or NextGen um, or no EHR at all, that this could be replicated and disseminated in some way. So these were the guiding kind of principles of the project. The structure of it was that we used uh, an off-the-shelf electronic blood pressure cuff, an Omron cuff, and uh, at the time, it was still relatively new, uh, Microsoft Health Vault, which is basically an aggregator of data. It'll connect with devices and applications. And what Reliant Medical Group was able to do was take the information from Health Vault, and it could come in in two ways. One would be the person was self-monitoring at home, and a connection had been set up so that when they plugged in their cuff, the data would automatically go to Health Vault. So that was one option. This was a dissemination grant, so we wanted to provide a secondary option for people that either didn't have access to home internet or computer, or people that didn't feel comfortable doing that. So we also put in place kiosks at the clinic where they could bring in their cuff and upload the readings to Health Vault there. In terms of workload, we really didn't want people to have to go out to a site to get this data. We wanted it to be pretty well integrated into their clinical workflow. And so the folks at Reliant were able to build an interface between Health Vault and their Epic EHR. And so automatically, without doing anything, when this data was brought into Health Vault, it would automatically go into a clinical flow sheet. And the value of that was that we could set up rules and alerts based on that data so folks wouldn't have to actually go um, go and look at, proactively look at it. Um, so they got both summaries of data um, and triggers if there was something that was happening that they needed to know about. There's pretty good protocols in place for medication changes and things like, and things like that. So the primary care physicians um, had okayed the protocols to have a team of diabetes care nurses call patients when they saw things going on and adjust medications as needed. So when they would do that, they would call um, and first, obviously, sort of troubleshoot if it was some kind of life issue, someone had passed away, they were going through some kind of uh, life change, or um, if this was sort of a legitimate pattern that was happening, and then they would adjust medications according to these protocols. Um, so we've just completed exit interviews for all of the folks in the randomized control trial. But I've done interviews with patients. We've done home observations with patients, interviews with the um, diabetes care nurses. And we also, so we had an intervention and control group. And the folks that were in the intervention, after exiting, they could choose to keep using the intervention. And folks in the control group could start to use it. And we've had a huge percentage of folks that were in the intervention group and have decided to keep using the system. So from a patient perspective, um, and we did again home observations to try to change as much as we could to make this as easy, as easy to use as possible. Um, but they're wanting to keep using it. Uh, the diabetes care nurses and primary care physicians of these patients are incredibly happy with it. They're willing to keep using it. And there's been basically three different elements of this that they've found valuable. One is that they've shortened the cycle in which they're getting data. And this is a similar thing 
um, in terms of when I'm talking about things. But instead of going three months between getting data points on these patients, they're going perhaps a week or even sooner. Um, so they're getting much more um, rapid cycles and they're, they're noting that their confidence level in the data is strengthened because of that. Um, the other thing has been that they've been able to view this in multiple ways. So um, we haven't required that patients have gone to look at their data. That hasn't been part of it if they haven't wanted to, but they're doing that. And the ability to see um, trends in what's going on and the same thing with, with providers has been an important piece of this. The other thing that this has been helpful for is if a, um, if the uh, diabetes care nurse and the patient are having a conversation about deciding whether to change medications, uh, patients in their perspective, from their perspective, have been much more open to doing that because it becomes a shared decision where they're both looking at um, similar data. And so that's been helpful. Um, so for a variety of reasons, again, getting data has helped these two sets of folks together make, in their impression, make better decisions than they would have before. Again, we've just done the exit interview, so we'll have actual clinical data about whether this has improved uh, outcomes. Luckily, there's about a 70% overlap between this reliant medical group and the insurance carrier um, for most of the folks. So we're going to get um, claims data and all kinds of other um, markers that we can look at. When we move to routine office visits, I'm going to talk about uh, another project that we're working on. Barry Saver is also involved in this, the primary care physician at UMass Medical School. And another one of my colleagues at UMass uh, does work in human factors. He does work in the field of driver behavior and transportation human factors. And what's been really helpful is he bring, has brought in a set of uh, data collection methods and um, analysis methods that have been really interesting to think about bringing in from that domain into uh, the healthcare setting. And there's a pretty significant overlap with some of the work that's going on here. So this was a, or is a project we're in the middle of, um, th funded through the National Science Foundation. So for engineers, this is a pretty typical organization that funds our research. And what we're really looking for is how we can model how physicians in primary care settings uh, search for and use information from EHRs. We're looking at how that is different or similar across several EHR vendor platforms. And the real question that we're trying to think about is, in addition to making these advancements in methodology for capturing and analyzing this type of data, we're also trying to figure out basically if information search patterns, when say an individual comes in for a primary care office visit, are platform dependent, meaning they change based on the design of the specific software system, or whether they're platform agnostic, meaning that perhaps they have an information search pattern that they want to execute, and then regardless of the design of the system, they go and execute uh, that search pattern. So again, we're trying, to, we're trying to get some grasp. It's probably going to be in the middle somewhere, but trying to get some understanding of it. So it's both that and trying to advance um, methodologies in how we capture and analyze this data. So the site that we've um, completed to date is a, is a community clinic that uses NextGen, um, which is a lower cost system that's often sold to uh, community uh, clinics. It's about the most horrible piece of software that I've ever seen in my life. Um, so we've, the gist of this is we use an eye tracker slightly different than the one that's used here. It's a mobile eye eye tracker. And basically, it's a head-mounted eye tracker um, that a person can be in a free-moving environment. And we've used it in a lot of non-health IT studies, but we're using it in this context in um, outpatient clinics when we go there. So basically, we can put this on a physician and then have them complete some task with the EHR in the environment that they work in. Um, and then when we get that data, it's basically a video, and it shows exactly the scene in front of them and then where they're looking at given points in time. So this is a sample uh, screen from NextGen. In the context of we're dealing with a pretty stand routine office visit for a patient with a couple chronic conditions, um, in the context of that visit, there's 20 
about 24 standard screens that they navigate through uh, to complete that office visit, both in uh, information retrieval and data entry. And when we've looked at the subjects so far, there's 24 screens, but a lot of them they visit multiple times throughout the, throughout the visit. And so the range in, term, in terms of number of screens visited for the subjects ranges from about 85 to about 150 um, on the visits. And so they're, they're searching through and um, entering data in a huge number of screens. So what we're in the middle of analyzing is this eye tracker data and to look at sequences in terms of what information they're looking at. And so we can get that. Um, we're also interested in sort of novel ways of analyzing that. So a lot of times eye tracker studies will look at common places that someone looked or whether they looked at a piece of information. And we're really trying to understand the process by which they look at information. And if we can do that, we can think about um, common transitions between different types of information. And if you had 20 people who always looked at things in the same order, you could start to make inferences about placement of different types of information by each other. So again, we're trying to think about, trying to think about what's going on. I've also done um, interviews and uh, surveys of these folks, the, the people that participated. And as you might expect, uh, the common theme is basically they're trying to build a story, right? What's the story of what's going on? Um, and the way that things are structured right now isn't helping them um, because information is so disjointed, basically. Um, so they bring up things like, even if I know something is important, if I know it's hard to find, I don't go and look for it. Um, so they, so the, again, that would be a sense for I've got some predetermined information search pattern that I want to execute, but the technology isn't allowing me to do that easily. But again, trying to think about what story they're trying to understand or build, and then working backwards and trying to figure out how can we structure the information in a way that allows them to build that more efficiently. In terms of hospitalizations in sort of acute care settings, we're looking at this idea of a care team using some type of um, health IT. This is a project, again, with my um, co or collaborator in industrial engineering, John Fisher, and then uh, the, um, an informaticist at Bay State Healthcare, Pat Brown. He's been a hugely wonderful person to work with. He has um, degrees in psychology and then was trained as a physician, so completely understands human factors and the value of that. So it's been great, great in terms of a collaborator in this type of work. So one of, one of the projects, again, funded by National Science Foundation that we're in the middle of, is looking at, based, you know, just had a, a short conversation with folks, looking at how individuals read progress notes in EHRs. Um, so we're trying to understand information search patterns. So transitions between different types of information, uh, what information they're focused on most, that kind of thing. Um, I'm assuming you probably all could uh, come to a hypothesis right now about what's going to happen. But trying to really understand the tension between volume of information in a note and format of data in the note, where they're looking, time spent, and how all of those impact the process by which they read the note. So are they thinking about narrative text different than structured data? Um, is placement important? Is volume of, of information important? So they have Cerner, and this is a screenshot of an anonymized progress note from their system. If you were just going to do, you know, you could, from a sort of HCI, human computer interaction perspective, you could look at this and make 80 changes without much effort, just in terms of kind of known heuristics. So there's lots of problems. They know there's lots of problems. But we're interested in somebody designed this in this way. And what are, how are they looking through this information when they, when they read progress notes? The red outlines are not in their system. It's just the text. But we're defining what these different areas of the note are. They all have the same structure. So you know what you'd expect, demographics, vital signs, that kind of thing. And then at the bottom is 
the impression and plan generated by, um, generated by the person that wrote the note. So one of the things that we saw was that volume of information in a section actually has no relationship uh, with how much time they spend reading something. So we had two very or three very different notes that folks read. And they basically would read a note. They could take as long as they wanted. And then they dictated a verbal handoff or summary of that so that we would have some anchor in terms of what, what they looked at versus what they said was important. So one of the things that you'll note, the, the interesting pieces of this really were in medications and impression and plan. So basically what we noticed was that regardless of how much text there was relatively in the impression and plan, that was where they spent their time reading. And no matter how much text was in the medications, they hardly ever read it or they spent very little of their time reading it. One other way to look at this was, is with these timeline graphs. And you can actually see pretty interestingly, so these are the three different notes and different subjects here as examples. There's actually a pretty similar structure in terms of how they go through this. So quickly skimming through different sections, getting to the impression and plan, and then potentially referencing back sections they think are interesting. Um, the most interesting thing, or one of the most interesting things, is in the second note, about, let's see if we can go back to this. So in that note, about 50% of the characters or volume of that note was in the medication profile. So it took up a huge amount of the note. And there's actually not a lot of distinguishable difference in how much time people spent looking at it or not looking at that. And there's a, you know, there's a couple folks that just hardly looked at it at all. In note two, the second one, the impression and plan was only about 12% of the note volume. But a huge amount of the time was spent looking at that. And not only then we looked at time, right, but then it's basically rate of looking at the information. So they're slowing way down. Uh, when they go to look at that information. So again, one way, again, with these eye tracker videos to think about, you know, what's going on in terms of the order in which they're looking at things uh, and, that, and what, what they're feeling like is important to look at. And uh, again, you could have hypothesized right away that when they go to read notes, they're, they have a huge reliance on narrative and the impression and plan. And we get confirmation of that from from interviews with folks. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of this is that in one of the notes, there was an elevated um, lab value. And it wasn't noted in the impression and plan. And so none of the subjects noticed it. Um, and so what's interesting about this is then potential issues can keep moving forward because you're going from one narrative to the next. And so think about this like a telephone game where things potentially, if we're not, if we're over relying on one source of data, um, we might be doing that at the expense of not, not seeing other kinds of, of information. So when we think back about this, again, we want to really think about the fact that this is building some kind of story, right, in all of these cases. So the issue is, though, that that story differs a lot based on the context. So back at the beginning, in my case, the story was about just me, and it was about one type of data. And that was an important story for me. I didn't need narrative journals. I didn't need to have feedback on this. Um, I could have, but I didn't need to. And so again, this was a very simple storyline for me that worked. Um, again, in the case of uh, caring for Edison after he was born, a few more types of data. Again, not narrative. It's discrete data. It's really important. Um, but again, very simple. Just sort of our family involved in this. We would bring this in our tablet into our pediatrician. And when they started asking us questions, we would pull up the reports on it and just give them the answers. So there was, it was useful, but we weren't sharing the information. We just had it, had access to it. 
When we think about the case with patients self-monitoring their uh, high blood pressure, their blood pressure outside of a formal care setting, again, this is one type of data. It's discrete data, um, but there's a couple differences now. It's being shared with care providers, and now there's shared decision making happening. And again, it's, it's not narrative. So it was very important in order to not increase workload that we figure out some way to understand the story in a way that's relevant without increasing workload. We might glean additional information by patients sending narrative journal reports about how they're feeling and their emotional well-being. But in this context, it was valuable um, to just have a very simple set of data. When we move, though, to the primary care physicians, all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, all of a sudden but they're gathering a whole slew of data and a lot of what they want is narrative data. So they'll, they'll go back and look at their past notes about the patient. They'll go and look at reports from specialists. Um, and so they, while, they're, while they are looking at when you had lab values done, um, whether they should order tests, whether you need immunizations, they are wanting a lot in, in narrative form. So, that starts to get a lot more complex in terms of how they're building the story that they want to build. Similarly, then when we move to progress notes, it shifts almost all the, other, all the way in the other direction where they're relying almost exclusively on narrative data. And they've moved away from wanting to look at discrete data. Again, they're building another type of story um, with and using different kinds of data to do that. So one of the points, just kind of in summarizing and going, going through these projects, is thinking about the fact that when we try to understand information search patterns in order to make decisions, we need to be very sensitive to context and um, what that is. In, in some cases, we actually might try to make things more complicated than they need to be. Um, where something simple would be helpful. And in other cases, we've simplified things where they really need complexity in terms of um, merging different kinds of data. So again, just a very high level overview of the types of some of the projects that we're working on. I wanted to leave time for discussion today. Um, but to give you some sense of the types, the types of things that we're interested in and in working on. Um, and I'll end with, I never talked about images <laughs> as, an, as an important type of, type of information. Um, but we also, we also think about, about how those, those play into this. So I'll leave it at that and um, take time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. And, and let me ask um, anyone who's in the room here who doesn't normally attend to, um, if you ask a question to, uh, hold down the mic button. Not, not so much for us to hear, but for the recording and the people who might be out there listening who can also send us questions via Twitter if they would like. Um, my, I was um, well interested in all three, but um, uh, the one on uh, physician notes, uh, uh, probably for those of us who are physicians are interested. One, one of the challenges I, I most consider to be the holy grail of informatics is um, um, <clears throat> the uh, the data that uh, we capture from physicians that, you know, we in informatics talk about secondary use and clinical decision support. Um, and to really do that kind of stuff well, you need structured data. Um, but um, it's become clear, much uh, very prominently clear as, as we adopt more um, EHRs, uh, that uh, physicians really like to read notes and, and they actually don't trust uh, check boxes and things like that. I'm wondering if you're uh, research has any insights into that um, debate or, or conversation? Yeah, so when we've had conversations with folks, I think this goes back to an interesting um, distinction and um, challenge between what the motivations are for the production of the note versus the um, desires in terms of using the note. And so in this case, 
in their platform, they actually haven't separated those things. Whatever's produced is shown. So, um, so there's a, an acknowledgement that the rationale for the production of the note might be a resident who wants to include as much as possible so that they don't get in trouble for leaving something out, which in their case is happening quite a bit. Um, and so there's the ability in their system, like a lot of places, to, with very little effort, get the structured data um, and automatically populate the note with it. So I think, so I think in, in, in some ways, and I'm not completely answering your question, but I think there's an issue around um, what we're capable of producing and in different contexts, what people want from that. So it might be that researchers are really interested in that data from one perspective. Um, it might be that a nurse who's supporting things is interested in it from a different perspective. The physician taking over might be interested from a different perspective. perspective. And so I think in some ways that's what's being lost is the needs assessment and assessment of actually the end user of what's helpful to them instead of what's produced is in full shown in the same way no matter what no matter what you want yeah so i have a question about this search this search pattern uh, thing interested me trying to infer what the pattern is so uh, it while you were talking about that, I was reminded of Elstein's work on hypothetical deductive reasoning. And in your work, have you been able to get at the degree to which the search pattern is sort of standard? Like, first I always look at this, then I always look at that, then they look at that, versus um, prompted by some need to explain an anomaly or need to achieve some kind of coherence? Yeah, so, so there's a couple different perspectives on this. I didn't talk about this, but some of, the, some of the preliminary work for this was not in health IT specifically. So we had looked at, um, I work with some folks who are very interested in patient safety and things like doing things to the wrong patient, giving them the wrong medication, that kind of thing. So, so they had devised some experiments and used the eye tracker where nurses and physicians, lab techs, all kinds of different folks did tasks that they would do every day. Um, and they had the eye tracker on so we could see what they were looking at. And the way that they did this was that in the last trial, they had the person who they were supposed to be giving a medication to, let's say for the nurse, was different than who it should have been given for. And again, these folks knew they're in an experiment, um, knew that they've got the eye tracker on, and about, in the case of the nurses, about 40% of them didn't identify this error. So our group came in and is, we're interested in trying to understand, again, this, the process of visual scanning. So we came in and used these eye tracker videos, and we were interested in sort of post hoc, we know we've got a group of people that identified this error, and we know we have a group of people that didn't, can we figure out differences in their visual scanning patterns? And so we developed a bunch of metrics and, and looked at that, and essentially, there is a big difference. So you have multiple identifiers on different artifacts, so a name and date of birth and medical record number. And basically, the people that identify errors are looking at one identifier across artifacts, and the people that don't identify it are looking at everything on an artifact, trying to remember it, and then looking at everything on the next one. So we pretty easily, basically, at the end, able to look at this and figure out visual scanning differences. So that got us interested in this idea of um, could we use some similar um, ways of looking at things to do that. So one of the things that we're interested in is at the end, and this, so this is so two pieces of this. For groups of, say, physicians that with the same task choose different plans going forward, 
are their search patterns within the records fundamentally different? So are there different search patterns that lead them to go in two different directions or <coughs> multiple directions with a patient? So we've collected the data, that's what we're looking at right now. Um, I don't think we can get at what you're talking about, Paul, without interviews and observations. So that's where mo a lot of our work to date has been focused on how we can capture this data and analyze it. And interviews and observations have been sort of post hoc, not aligned with that. Um, and we've been fully aware that that's a limitation and um, are now starting to address it. So, no, I mean, I think it's, I think you just can't do it without talking to the people. And that just hasn't been, we know it's important, but we've concentrated in a different area. Yeah. I got another question. Um, yeah, it's to do with the story. So, the story seems to be a theme, part of the story here. You, you mentioned it in several places that people were trying to construct a story or get the story or understand the story. Is there a, is there a way to tell when they have or haven't accomplished that? When they've gotten to a state where the story has happened? So, so that's been part of the goal in doing, say, with the progress note, at the end of it, having them do a verbal handoff so that we can understand what their story is. Um, so in that way, we've forced them to generate a story. Um, so every, every time we've done that, it's been sort of at, at the end of the task, asking them to verbalize what the situation is. So in the case of the primary care physicians, they're summarizing things and giving us their, um, they're summarizing the story verbally and then giving us what their plan is and basically entering it in. Um, so yes and no, we force them to generate a story, right? There's some, something that's not necessarily realistic about that potentially. Um, but we have, I mean, we have, they do, they do generate one. Yeah. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, when you come back, how long are you going to be here and what are you going to do? So, <laughs> no, that's, I mean, it's very interesting. So. So for sure we'll be back August through November, so about five months. Um, one of the things that is really great about the group here is that you're interested in similar issues but have taken a variety of different um, methodological approaches. So where we've been weaker in terms of observations and interviews of things, you know, that's an area where uh, you all are very strong at. And so part of the interest has been in, um, say, something like this. Can we figure out if what people can verbalize as being important lines up with what they actually are looking at? So, so there's some interesting things there. Um, I've had a, I had a conversation with Joan Ash this morning. She brought up, you know, a huge number of other interesting things going on and then have other conversations with people. So. Um, a little bit is to be determined, but but the initial the initial um, prompt is besides you all being fun and nice people, <laughs> is that you're doing interesting things in an area that's similar, but um, your strengths are in in different in different areas areas than mine.